mind as an action that takes place so often that it begins to be practiced subconsciously by those who do it. And so you continue to do something over and over again, and there's a time when you can perform that action without even giving second thought to it. You know, that happens to me sometimes driving home. I've driven from here to my house so often that sometimes I get my driveway, I've been driving the whole time thinking about something else, and I think, how did I get home? And that's pretty dangerous, but that happens. I saw an uh, article this week on Odyssey Online about 20 habits that people practice without even thinking about it. Some are like some people bite their cheek and they don't even think about it. Or they interrupt people when they speak, or they might shake their leg in nervousness, or smack their gum, or pick in their face. They're not thinking about it. They just do these things over and over again, and it's just one of their habits. And that can happen religiously. I mean that sometimes we can do things over and over again that it just becomes a habit. In Church of Christ, we're different, and that's on purpose. It's not that we want to be weird. You know, Titus 2.14 calls us a peculiar people in the King James. We're God's own special treasure, and we're different. And that's because it is our goal and desire to follow the New Testament for all that we do in faith or practice, as the song we just sung emphasized, to do all in the name of the Lord. But there's something that I want to warn us about. And that is, we can do the same things over and over again in our religious services, particularly as it relates to our worship, to the point that we don't even give a second thought to it anymore. I mean, how many times have you sat in the same seat that you're in right now, sung the same songs, and done the same things? There's nothing wrong with that, but it must never become just a ritualistic habit. You've heard this saying before, you ought to practice what you, what you preach, and that's right. But on the opposite end of that, we ought to preach what we practice. That is, if we do something religiously, we ought to stand up and say it so that people understand it and that they get a handle on who we are and who we are aiming to be. And so over the next four Sundays, beginning today, I want to preach a series of lessons that I'm just entitling Preaching What We Practice. And we're going to talk about why we sing the way that we do, the Lord's Supper, why we practice giving in the manner that we do, and then the last sermon will combine both the praying and the preaching. And why do we do this? And so that our friends and neighbors won't ask us and we won't have an answer. The Bible says we should. 1 Peter 3.15 says, be ready always to give an answer for every man that asks you. Colossians 4.6 says, be ready to answer every man. And Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.25, gently correct those that are in error. That's the purpose. So the next four weeks, I have two real emphasis in these lessons. The first is to stir up our mind with remembrance. Brethren, we must never get the idea that the people that worship with us in some are 10 and 12 and 13, that, oh, they know why we do this. And it just becomes a habit, and then one day you wake up and you say, how could they turn away from the New Testament way? Well, we might have taken it for granted that we just sing without the instrument, and of course they know why. And your son or daughter, they might ask you, and you say, oh, you know why we do that. No, we don't. We need to figure it out and follow what the New Testament says. And so, as Peter said, he wanted to stir up individuals' minds by way of remembrance. That's one purpose. But the second is, and maybe you're a visitor here and you fall into this second category, maybe you don't agree with us, and I understand in writing these lessons ahead of time that everybody, and there may be some watching online or other, that don't agree with the way that we do things and why, and hopefully these lessons can penetrate the heart and mind and at least cause us to be open and honest and question and open up the Bible and see, is this right or wrong? Is what I do in religion specifically related to worship, is it right? Do I have authority? 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, test everything. Bottoms was good. And that's what I want to do. I want to test these practices and see if they're true. And if you find that we're in error, you believe us to be in such, we want you to talk to us about it so that we can align our lives with the scriptures. And so that's what we want to do. Let's begin with this saying. There are misconceptions about this. Now, this isn't anything new. It's always been this way. God's people and God himself has often been misunderstood as to what we believe and what God has taught in practice. You remember in John 2 and verse 19, Jesus drove out the money changers, and then he says, I'm going to destroy this temple, and in three days, I'm going to rebuild it. And John says that the people responded, 46 years we've been building this temple, and do you mean to tell us you're going to rebuild it in three days? And John inserts this parenthetical note. He spoke of his body, and then the disciples after the resurrection, they understood it. In Acts 6 and also in Acts 21, the Jews of that day, they accused both Stephen and Paul of preaching against the law of Moses in a negative way. They said they don't have any regard for the law of Moses. Now, that wasn't totally true. They misunderstood both Stephen and Paul. Stephen and Paul revered the law of Moses, but they wanted to teach people what the law of Moses actually pointed to and that it had a period of ceasing. You know, when Paul went to Rome in Acts 28, he shows up there, and the first thing he does, he gets with the Jewish people, and he says, listen, I know you've heard a lot of bad things about me, but I just want to tell you the truth. And they say, we haven't heard anything about you. 
But Acts 28 and verse 22, concerning this church, we know that this sect is everywhere spoken against. And that's still true. I mean, people still misunderstand churches of Christ, and they won't come to a Christian and say, why do you all do that? Why do you all do this? They'll go on Google or read some opposing article and say, oh, I know who you guys are. And so before we start on why we sing the way we do, I want to go through some misconceptions. The first one, you all just don't like music. Now, every time I've told somebody that I'm a member of the Church of Christ, just about every time, if they disagree with me theologically, this is often the first thing that they bring up. Oh, you're the no music people. Have you ever heard that before? And you know, the truth is, we're not against music at all. And I hope you haven't said that we're against music. There's a certain type of music that the New Testament authorizes, and that's what we want to espouse. But we're not against music any more than Paul was against circumcision. You know, in Galatians 5, 2, Paul says, now, if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Or Galatians 5, 6, in Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith that works by love. Paul's point is, you can't appeal to circumcision to make you right religiously. But Paul wouldn't be against circumcision for medical purposes or otherwise. It's just not a religious ordinance to be bound in conjunction with the law of Moses. There are a lot of people that are musically inclined and talented in churches of Christ, but just because that's the case doesn't mean you're not practicing in worship, and it doesn't mean that we're anti-music. Number two, isn't that just your tradition? And sadly, this is sometimes said by those who claim to be Christians and want to follow the New Testament. Well, we don't use the instrument because it's just, we just, that's just the way they do it. But that's not the case at all. You know, if it's just our tradition, then people can do whatever they want. But Jesus taught that worship must be in spirit and in truth. It is above our tradition. Now, we have some, but the fact, the fact that we sing without the instrument, the mechanical instrument, is not just our tradition. It's based on biblical conviction. Number three, we're all just trying to be different. We just want to be different. Now, there are churches trying to be different. There's a church right now, they meet in a gym. How about that? Working out for Jesus. Yeah, they meet in a gym. There's another church that meets at a local bar because they want to appeal to people. And then there's another one that meets in a movie theater because they say the seats are comfortable and cushy. I don't know what you think about sitting on these pews. Maybe about the movie seats. But anyway, people try to be different. But the fact that we worship without the mechanical instrument is not because we want to be different. Just because we want to be weird. John 17, 17, Jesus says this is what makes us different. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is true. The idea that we want to do what the New Testament says, that's what sets us apart and makes us different. And so these misconceptions that people often have about why we sing without the instrument, let's just take these off the table. It's not because it's just our tradition. It's not because we're merely trying to be different. And it's not because we don't like music at all. It's not because we can't afford an organ or a piano or anything like that. It's because of what the Bible teaches. And now go to Colossians chapter 3. Go to Colossians chapter 3. I think this is where the discussion really starts and ends. This really isn't a long, I guess it can be a long discussion depending on who you're talking to, but Colossians 3 is where we find the authority principle being taught. There are other passages, but I just want to highlight Colossians chapter 3 this morning. In Colossians 3 and verse 1, Paul writes to people that have been baptized with Christ, Colossians 2, 12, if you've been raised with Christ, and now he says in Colossians 3, 1, if you've been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth, where you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. And then he goes through a list of behaviors, and he says, you've got to put these things to death, do away with those practices, and then in about verse 12, he changes and says, put on love and do these things. But then when you get to verse 15, as Wesley read for us a moment ago, he says, let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you were called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord, and whatever you do. And word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Underline verse 17, because this is where the discussion really begins and ends. And on Wednesday night, George Bill's been teaching a Bible class, really emphasizing this principle. And maybe all of you haven't been there, but if you can make it, you should come. Because this idea of Colossians 3.17 says, whatever we do, whether it's something we say or something we practice, we need to do it in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ. You might have a needy neighbor to knock on your door for butter at 1 a.m. in the morning, and that wouldn't really move you at all. But if, if Lakeland PD knocked on your door at 1 a.m. and said, open up in the name of the law, well, that would be different. And this idea that Paul says, whatever we do in word or deed, we need to do it by the authority of Christ. This principle says, do I have authority for what I practice in worship <coughs> in every area of my life? And the New Testament gives no authority for an individual to worship God with a mechanical instrument of music. This is why we don't worship the instrument. It is the Colossians 3.17 principle that says, 
you don't have authority to do it, and therefore you can't practice it. The Bible, when it's silent on a matter, when God doesn't tell us to partake in a certain behavior, that is God's way of forbidding to practice. God doesn't tell us to do it, and therefore we cannot engage in it and just say, well, God doesn't care about that. And we'll talk about some objections to this near the end of the lesson, some things that people say and respond. But just think about Jesus. Did Jesus ever commit a sin? The most righteous man who ever lived, followed the law perfectly, did everything that no one else could do. In fact, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, I haven't come to destroy the law, but fulfill it. But you know, when Jesus was on earth, though the high priest was viewed as the highest office in the land under the Old Testament system, he couldn't be a high priest. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And this principle of silence is taught in Hebrews 7 and also in Hebrews 8. And the fact that the tribe of Levi was the tribe that God selected to produce the high priest. And Jesus couldn't, just because he was a good man, become a high priest, even though the Bible didn't expressly forbid him from doing so. And so in this discussion about a change of the law, Hebrews 7, 14 says, It is evident that our Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah, which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. That is, Moses didn't say anything about priests springing up from the tribe of Judah, and therefore Jesus couldn't be a high priest. In Hebrews 8 and verse 4, it says if he were on earth, he couldn't be a priest, because there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, and Jesus doesn't meet that criteria. And so because the Old Testament law doesn't always list, and there are some occasions where it does this, but in the Hebrew writer's mind, he says, because God doesn't say Judah can produce high priests, Jesus couldn't be one. The principle of silence forbids Jesus from being a high priest, and the principle of silence today forbids people from worshiping <coughs> God except for they live in the music. When people come to our worship service and they see that we don't have an instrument, somebody says, well, the Bible doesn't say we can't. More about that near the end of the lesson. But the burden of proof is on that individual to produce the passage that says that God allows us to do this. Colossians 3, 17 says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name. And so we should be saying, where does the Bible say that I can practice this? Go to John chapter 4 and notice what Jesus said. John 4, and let's start in verse 23. Jesus is having a conversation with a woman at the well of Samaria about worship. And notice the criteria that he says must be present for worship to be acceptable to God. John 4, 23, Jesus says, The hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, because the Father seeks such to worship him. That is, God is looking for people that worship this way. And now, verse 24, God is the spirit, and they that worship him, M-U-S-T, must worship how? In spirit and in truth. Both of those things must be present. Spirit deals with the right attitude, and truth deals with the right action. I don't deny that you could worship God with an example of instrument in spirit and be rather excited about doing it and be passionate and be thrown into that activity and really mean it. But you couldn't do it in truth because you don't have a passage to say that God approved of that action. And Jesus says you have to have both, just like you could sing without the instrument and you could practice that in truth, but if you don't have the right attitude, the right disposition, God would reject that as well. And so we learn this principle from Jesus, that worship must be in spirit and in truth. And when we don't have truth on the matter, we can't practice it with God's approval. I talk to people and study with them, and they just assume sometimes, because so many people worship this way, surely there must be a passage on it. And I'll say, would you find the New Testament passage that authorizes mechanical instruments of music and worship? So without thinking about it, just because so many people have done it, they begin to search immediately. And to their surprise, there isn't a passage there that teaches it. Christians, let's remember this principle. The Bible teaches Christians to sing, and I'm going to pull up a slide of those passages in a minute. But just because the Bible tells us to sing, the Bible says, well, sing, God, I'm going to show you the many New Testament passages that teach that. That is not why the instrument is not allowed in worship. The instrument is forbidden because of the silence of God on this matter, because God doesn't say use the instrument. That's why we can't use the instrument in worship, and it's not just because God has told us to sing. If God were to say sing and use the instrument, we would do that. But God has said to sing and hasn't given us the authority to use the instrument, and that's why it's absent from our worship. These are the New Testament passages that speak about singing, and you can read every one of these. And what you're going to find consistently is that the early church they sang. And it's not because Paul didn't know about instruments of music. They were in the Old Testament, and many of the idol and pagan temples around them in the first century, they worshiped God with instruments. But in Acts 16, 25, as Paul and Silas are in prison, the Bible says they prayed and they sang hymns to God. In Romans 15 and verse 9, it's quoting Psalm 18 and verse 49. It says that we are to sing praises 
to God's name. That is, the Gentiles and the Jews not there in this relationship. Sing with the Spirit and the understanding, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. It goes along with the idea of John 14, John 4, 24. Sing with the Spirit, that is, the right mindset, and also with the understanding. We've got truth and we've got spirit. Paul says, I will sing with the spirit and also with the understanding. Ephesians 5, 19 says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16, we've looked at that. Hebrews 2 and verse 12 says that Jesus sings in the midst of the church. It's a quotation from Psalm 22 and verse 22. Jesus says, in the midst of the assembly, in the midst of the congregation, will I sing praise to his name. We're to offer the fruit of our lips to God, Hebrews 13, 15, and then James 5, 13 says that Christians, if you are happy, you should sing. We sing without the instrument. We engage in acapella music to God because we want to glorify God in the way that God has commanded us to do so. And we don't find the passage. And if somebody produces the passage, we ought to be honest enough to say we're going to worship God the instrument because that's what he wants. But until such a passage emerges, we can't do it in good faith because God hasn't given us the authority to practice it. And so now you might be thinking, well, we can just sing the invitation. That's the end of it. And really, at this point, we could. We're not going to do that just yet. But if it's this simple, if you've got Colossians 3, 17, and the Bible says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, you all in the name of the Lord Jesus, and you can't find instrumental music used in the worship, God doesn't command it, there is no implication in the New Testament that God desires to worship, why do so many people do it? I mean, you can just walk into churches today, and people, by the thousands, will be worshiping God without second thought with the instrument. And if Colossians 3.17 is this simple to grasp, why is such the case? Well, as I mentioned, everybody doesn't agree with that. And these are some of the arguments that are sometimes used, and I just want to go through each of them, and let's see what people sometimes say. This first one. Did they use instruments in the Old Testament, and haven't you read the book of Psalms? And the answer to both of those questions is yes. They used it in the Old Testament, and yes, I've read the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms does give permission to the Israelites to use instruments of music in the Old Testament, but that's not where this discussion begins. I want you to go to 2 Chronicles 29. Go to 2 Chronicles 29 and let's notice something. This is where instrumental music is mentioned. And I believe I'm on verse 25. And notice the language that's used here as these individuals worship God with the instrument. And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and harps according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet. For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophet. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. And Hezekiah commanded to offer burnt offerings on the altar. When the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets, with the instruments ordained by David, the king of Israel. And all the congregation worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this, all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Underline in verse 25 that this was the commandment of the Lord by the prophets. You know why they used instruments in the Old Testament? Because God gave them authority to do it. Psalm 150 talks about that. The last psalm in the book of Psalms says, Worship God with all of these instruments. And then it ends emphatically with verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. But the conversation doesn't stop with the book of Psalms. The question must be posed, where is the New Testament passage that authorizes us to do this? We're not under the Old Testament law. If you look at Colossians 2.14, the Bible says that God has taken the law out of the way and nailed it to the cross. In Romans 7, 1 through 4, Paul makes this analogy. He says, Brethren, I speak to you that know the law. You know that a law has dominion over the man as long as he lives. And then he uses this illustration. If a woman be married to a man, she's bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if he be dead, she's free from that law so that she might marry another. But if while he's alive she be married to another man, she would be called an adulteress. And Paul's point is that the old law is dead, Romans 7 and verse 4. You're no longer under the old law, you're under the new law. And we can't be under two laws to God at the same time. Christians aren't under the Old Testament law of Moses. We're under the New Testament law of Christ. And so to go back to the old law to appeal to it and say, oh, I want to do what they did in worship back there. That's not where we ought to start the conversation. The conversation begins in the New Testament. Where is the New Testament passage? Furthermore, the old law says more than just worship with instruments. In Psalm 66, verse 13 through 15, David talks about offering up sacrifices. I've never heard anybody who makes the argument that the Psalms authorized instrument of music say, we ought to sacrifice bulls to God in worship because after all, you did it in the Old Testament. 
Such would contradict Hebrews 9.28, which calls Jesus our once for all time sacrifice. Listen, we appeal to Jesus for our authority. In Matthew 17 and verse 5, Jesus says, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. When Jesus rose from the grave in Matthew 28, 18, he says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and teach all nations. Jesus says he has all authority. Question, if Jesus has all of it, how much authority does that leave for you or for me? You see, we can't go back to the law of Moses. We've got to find authority for instrument of music under the New Testament law of Christ. Nowhere in the Old Testament was there ever this idea that you should just take parts of the law. In James 2 and verse 10, James says, Now if any man wants to be justified by the law and offends at one point, he's guilty of all of it. And so if a person wants to borrow the Old Testament instrument of music from the Old Testament law, he or she must go and get everything from that Old Testament and begin to practice it. And Paul says, if you do that, Galatians 5 and verse 4, if you attempt to be justified by the law, you fall into grace. And so the Old Testament use of psalms wouldn't be a good reason to use instrument of music or provide for it. Number two, the Bible doesn't say that we can't. The Bible doesn't say that either. The Bible doesn't say thou shalt not worship with instrumental music, but we've already talked about this. The Bible doesn't have to. Suppose you went home today, and when you got home, there was a stack of pizzas and credit cards just waiting for you at the door. And when you call to object and say, how did all of this get here? They say, well, we mailed you some stuff about it, and you never sent us anything back saying you didn't want it, so here it is. You go to the mechanic, and you want a $30 oil change, and you come back, and you've got a $900 bill. And when you begin to talk to them about it, you say, listen, I came for an oil change, and the mechanic begins to explain to you, I understand that. But I looked, and you had some hoses, and you had a radiator problem, and you did need some new tires, and by the way, you didn't tell us not to. And based on that, we just went ahead, and we hooked you up, and the bill's waiting on you. What would you argue? You would argue that I didn't have to tell you not to do it, but I told you that I wanted the $30 oil change. My silence on the radiator and the tires, that excluded those things. And in the New Testament, when Jesus tells us how to sing to him and he excludes the instrument of music, his silence on that matter, he forbids it. In Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu, they offer up strange fire to God, the Bible says, which God commanded them not. And in Jeremiah 7 and verse 31, and also in Jeremiah 23, 25, they offer up their children in sacrifice to God, and then Jeremiah adds this, which the Lord did not command them. The Bible doesn't have to say you shall not. The Bible authorizes by what it says, and then it forbids by what it doesn't say. And this isn't some Church of Christ technique that we've used. It's always been true in the Bible. Look at Acts 15. Look at Acts 15 and notice verse 1. And this is the controversy about whether or not they ought to practice circumcision or not. And Acts 15 and verse 1 says, Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so that was the doctrine. There were people going about, and they were saying, As long as you circumcise by the law of Moses, if you don't do that, you can't be saved. And so these Christians, they meet in Jerusalem to figure this controversy out. And at first, Peter gets up and he has some things to say. And then in verse 13, James gets up and he has some things to say. But notice what he says in verse 24. For as much as we've heard that certain went out from us and troubled you with words, subverting your souls, and they said that you must be circumcised and keep the law, and then underline this last part, to whom we gave no such command. You see, James argues that our silence on binding of circumcision forbade people from the need to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. James says those people were in error for teaching that you had to be circumcised according to the law of Moses because we didn't give them a commandment. James and the other apostles reason it this way. People should only teach what we've commanded them to teach by the authority of Jesus Christ. And to teach circumcision without the authority, it was to violate God's law. And the same thing is true about this question about instrumental music. God has given no such commandment to practice it, and to do so is inconsistent with what God wants from us. Number three, God has given people musical talents, and I believe we should use them. You know, why would God give me the ability to play the keyboard or play the guitar if he really didn't want me to use it in worship? Well, listen, God's blessed every one of us with talent, but worship isn't a talent show. Just because God's given us talent, you say, well, God's given you ability, that doesn't mean he wants you to practice it in worship. Furthermore, this is a pretty selfish one. I mean, why stop at music? God's given some people the ability to bake and to sew, and some people can dunk a basketball. So we ought to set up a Fisher Price goal here and dunk for Jesus, because after all, if God's given people some talent or ability, he wouldn't want that to go to waste, would he? Or maybe somebody ought to cook blueberry muffins for Jesus, because after all, They've got the ability to cook those. You know God's given us talent and ability, and we can exercise that talent and ability without running into conflict with what he said elsewhere. God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth, and the fact that I may be musically inclined is no reason to simply say, 
God wants me to introduce him in worship. I don't think God would mind if we did. Whenever people say this, I always say, who told you that? God's revealed his mind in the Bible, and it's rather presumptuous to assume that God wouldn't care. In 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 8, there's a man named Uzzah who touches the oxen when it stumbles as they're transporting the ark of God, and he touches it and, it di and he dies immediately. You might argue from that, that, well, God wouldn't mind after all. He's saving the ark of the covenant that represents God's presence. It was a good thing to do. It cost us his life. We ought to say in the spirit of David in Psalm 19, verse 13, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, and let them not have dominion over me, and then I'll be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I don't want to engage in presumptuous sin that says, well, I don't think God cares about that, and because of that, I'll practice it anyway. And then the last one, I believe this is, no, there's one more. The book of Revelation has this. And it does. In Revelation 5 and verse 8 and Revelation 14, 2, there's a mention of a harp or harps. Now, one of those doesn't say they played harps. One says the voices sounded like the voice of many harpers harping. The book of Revelation is filled with symbolic language and to appeal to the book of Revelation <coughs> for authority for instrumental music is a dishonest thing. Again, there's incense in the book of Revelation. There's a beast there with many eyes around it. We wouldn't use those things and say, well, this is authority for using it. Just think about the things that are taking place in heaven that aren't true about earth. In Matthew 22, verse 30, Jesus says, In heaven, people aren't married, and they don't engage in marriage. Would you say today, based on that passage, people just ought to split up and be divorced because we're trying to reproduce what we see in heaven? Whatever John's talking about, and I would argue even in those passages, he's not emphasizing that they worship the instrument at all. He's doing something to stimulate the minds of those who he's writing to. But the book of Revelation doesn't provide any authority for instrumental music. And then the last one, which is probably the most common, though people don't use this one a lot, I like it. I think that's really among all the, and I've talked to a lot of people, and I've got a who may watch this recording, and I've talked to people about this question. Among the other reasons, this may be the real one, or one of the favorites. At the, at the end of the day, people just like it. And there's nothing wrong with liking it. But just because we like something, or we think it's good, or it really, quote unquote, livens up the worship in our minds, it's not about us. One man said, a man attended worship where he was, and he left, and he said, I didn't like worship today. And the man responded, Ew, we weren't worshiping you. And that's right. In Acts 10 and verse 26 and in Revelation 19, 10, John falls down before an angel. Cornelius fell down before Peter. And both times, those men are told to get up and worship God. It really doesn't matter what we like or what we would want to be done. We're here to worship God. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9 says we want to be found pleasing to him. And whatever he has said, that's what we need to try to do is glorify him. And as it relates to the music question, if we really want to honor and glorify God, we'll sing a cappella praise to him as we find the Lord in the and then the last thing before we extend the invitation is we need to sing for the glory of God. Many of us already believe this principle, and this is one of those sermons where members of Church of Christ loudly exclaim, Amen, yes, let's worship without the instrument, let's do things that we find authority for, and rightfully so. <coughs> but this goes just beyond worshiping without instrumental music or mechanical instrumental music. We ought to be saying to ourselves, what do our songs teach? Because music teaches theology. And just because I sing a song without the mechanical instrument of music, does the song communicate the truth? We need to examine our songs and make sure that they teach the truth about God and about Jesus Christ. There are passages in the New Testament that many believe were the catalyst for songs in the first century. Passages like 1 Timothy 3.16. God was manifest in the flesh, seen of angels, justified in the spirit, received up into heaven, preached to the Gentiles. Now those are rich and deep theological truths, and our songs ought to be filled with the same thing. Just because it's soft and it's nice and we don't have the instrument doesn't mean that it's God approved. The Bible says make melody in our hearts. You know, whether there's 40 people in here or 400, we ought to sing like we're singing to God. We ought to really be excited about offering up our worship to God because God doesn't have to accept our worship in song just because we do it without the instrument. We ought to be people that stir up in our hearts and sing and make melody. Paul says if the word of Christ is in us richly, it will involve us singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Are you thankful that God has saved you? approve it in song. Another thing is we encourage one another. We're not here to worship each other, but the New Testament says that we encourage one another when we sing. <clears throat> Teach one another in songs and hymns. And so when you say, I don't like that song, or I don't sing well, and you don't open up your mouth and glorify God with one mouth, Romans 15, 6, you rob me of the encouragement that's right through mine, that you owe me as a brother and sister in Christ, and vice versa. The New Testament says we're going to teach and admonish one another in Psalm 10 and spiritual songs. And you teach and admonish me when you sing the way that you should, and that works both ways.
And so we should sing and glorify God in all the items of worship that we do. So far as I can see, singing is the only one in heaven. There won't be any need to remember the Lord's death because we'll be in his presence. God surely doesn't need our offerings there. There won't be any giving of our means. There'll be no need to pray. We'll be in God's presence. Surely there'll be no need to preach the good news because we will behold all that the good news told us about. But the aspect of singing, Revelation 15, 3 says that we will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. And if we're going to sing there, now's a good time to practice and be sure that we really want to sing and glorify God. I know this is sort of, like I said, charming the force for some people. And Peter says, stir up our minds by way of remembrance. Remind us of why we do the things we do in worship. And this is just one. Singing without the instrument is something we do because we don't find New Testament authority to do otherwise. As Paul said in Galatians 4, 16, we should become enemies with others because we're simply telling the truth. And we ought to challenge people in the spirit of love and persuasion to study this matter with us and produce the passage that allows people to do that. And those of us that sing without the instrument, we should do it to the glory of God as the melody swells within our heart and we're filled with the spirit and we want to glorify him. It's interesting. When Jesus was on earth, one of the last things he did with his disciples was sing. Matthew 26 and verse 30 says, When they went out to the Mount of Olives, they sung a hymn. And it may very well be the first thing we do when we get to glory. After we fall down before God and thank Him for saving our souls, the last thing Jesus did with His apostles, or one of the last things on earth, may be one of the first things we do with God for all eternity. And God wants us to sing and glorify Him. The instrument that God is interested in in the New Testament age is the individual. We have to sing and make melody in our hearts. He has the authority to tell us how to worship, and He also has the authority to tell us how we ought to be saved. Jason's going to lead us in a song, and maybe we need to obey the gospel. The same Jesus that tells us what we need to do in worship tells us what we need to do in response to his gracious offer of salvation. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by what we hear from God's word. Allow the word to generate faith in your mind. In the book of John 8, 24, Jesus says that if you don't believe that I'm here, you'll die in your sins. And God wants everybody to believe the truth about Jesus. John 3, 16. Turn from sin and repent. Acts 17, 30 says, God commands everybody everywhere to repent. Confess Jesus as the Son of God. Romans 10 and verse 10, unto salvation. And then be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 22, 16 says, at that point, God washes away your sins. And then you can rise from the dead and then until the day that you die or until Jesus comes again. Maybe you have a question about what we taught. Maybe you said, you said something, I disagree with that. I want to talk to you about it and study with you on this. And I want to encourage members of South Florida Avenue over the next three weeks. I know you do this all the time, but especially over the next three weeks. Let's invite our friends and neighbors so that we can preach what we practice. If you need to be restored today, if you need to request the prayers of the church, you can do that as well. Jason's going to lead us. Come down as we stand and as we sing.